any moment this system can freeze up. And when it does freeze up, there might not be a smooth transition to the next system. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. We have an important returning guest today, Bix Weir, founder of the TheRoadToRuta.com and widely known uh, commentator on financial uh, reliability and unreliability in our markets, rigging of markets, and the good guys, the bad guys, and the banksters. Bix is here with us again on Reluctant Preppers to give us an update on the direction that things are turning as we head into the fall and into the presidential elections. Bix, thanks for joining us again here on Reluctant Preppers. Hey, thank you, Don. Again, it's a very interesting time to be working in this business and keeping an eye on what's going on as <laughs> everything seems to be going on right now. I, I have a son who, for, for whom this will be his first presidential election and that he's able to vote. He's also a uh, journalist and studying that in school and has been able to participate in actually seeing some of the presidential candidates in person and uh, it, tomorrow he's going to be seeing a vice presidential candidate in person, and it's he won't talk about anything else. It, it's it's one of the most bizarre uh, seasons we've ever seen, maybe the most, and probably by far in that regards. But it seems to be also echoed in what's going on in the world economic scene. Is just uh, over and over we talk to different experts on here who are saying this is what is happening here, the scale of it, the the uh, the scope of it, the lawlessness of it, etc. It's just unprecedented in uh, in recorded history. You uh, recently published, in fact, just end of last week, published a, um, a podcast by uh, Sean Turnbull from the SGT Report interviewing Bill Holter and Jim Sinclair. And the title of that was, The Period That We're Living In Is The Most, uh, the most Dangerous Period In History Is Today. And in that, they addressed several topics, uh, including uh, sort of the, the meltdown of, of the Deutsche Bank and uh, accumulation of gold by uh, other central banks and uh, political unrest in the Middle East. But before we get into that and some of those other topics, uh, as well as the other podcast you published by uh, our, uh, Mr. Armstrong talking about the most likely meltdown is going to come from the bond markets. But first, if we could gently give you a hard time and ask you... Um, since when we had you back here, I believe it was in August, you were talking about that by this time of year, you expected to see some uh, major upset. And goodness knows there's been a lot of major things going on. But the dollar is still standing at the moment, and the international banking system seems to be wobbly but standing. So can you give us an understanding of what has, what has failed and what looked like it's closer to failure than the last time we had you on? Well, sure. It, you know, I'd always, for the last year or so, said... The good guys want to start crashing the system in September, and the bad guys want it in October. Um, we're right in the heart of that, and and it was clear if you watch the markets and you're you're in tune with what's going on, it's clear that the the takedown of Deutsche Bank is is a big deal. I mean, they are known as the largest systemic bank as far as uh, the derivative situation over there. With I think it's nobody really knows anymore. It used to be seventy five trillion uh, dollars, and now it's 42, 43 trillion euros. Um, anything with a T on the end of it is is systemically risky. Um, but it was clear that the uh, United States, people within the United States are out to take down Deutsche Bank. They they levied a $14 billion fine on them when their market cap was in $16 billion at the time. Um, that is, it, it is a clear shot to the heart of Deutsche Bank. Now, whether or not it is, is intended to be the thing that kills the Deutsche Bank, which if, if Deutsche Bank goes down, there is no recovery from that. They're one of those too big to fail banks. And nobody really talks about a too big to fail bank because the consequences of a too big to fail bank actually failing is the destruction of the unbacked fiat monetary system because all these banks are interconnected. And we almost had it back in 2008 when the uh, AIG crashed and all the banks started to crash. Um, and Lehman Brothers went down and Bear Stearns went down. This is this is bigger than that. 
Back then, it took $700 billion in the U.S. Congress to give to the banksters um, so they could leverage it up to 20 or 30 uh, 20 or 30 billion, which or trillion, which is what they really needed, uh, and banks can do that with fractional reserve lending. So, yeah, I mean, I, I would say the good guys did do two things basically at the end of September. One was begin the takedown of Deutsche Bank, and number two was to pass the JASTA bill, the Justice Against Terrorist bill that gave uh, people the right to sue Saudi Arabia for 9-11. Gigantic, gigantic deal. Um, the reason they weren't allowed to do that up to now was because of the U.S. involvement in, in 9-11 as well. Um, and if you're talking about specific people within the Saudi government, um, Prince Bandar, the, the U.S. Uh, ambassador, was best friends with George Bush Jr. And they, Prince Bandar's wife funded directly the, the Saudi terrorists. I mean that that's a huge deal, and now with the jazz to bill out there, they can you know uncover all these rocks that weren't allowed to be uncovered, and uh, it what it also does is reverse. As Saudi Arabia has already said they would start selling U.S. assets, so it'll reverse the petrodollar scam that was set up in the 1970s with the Kissinger, where the U.S. demanded that the Saudis made a deal with the Saudis that they would only sell their their oil in U.S. dollars. And then with those dollars, they would reinvest them into the U.S. system, buying U.S. bonds and buying U.S. stocks. This is going to be the reversal of that. Um, so, yeah, I think at the end of September, the, the good guys fired two lethal shots to the bad guys. Um, it hasn't collapsed the system yet, but it's only a matter of time, I believe. Everybody's talking about Deutsche Bank getting a bailout from the government, although their government, the German government, has already told – other countries that they can't get a bailout, such as Greece, is a great example. So, the Germ and the German government doesn't want to bail out Deutsche Bank either, and they they've made that very clear because they're ready to destroy the system as well. So, I I think the the system is in the process of being destroyed right now. Um, I think another key date is uh, October twenty eighth, which is I I think it was the bad guys date I've gotten from a couple people, but October twenty seventh is when Deutsche Bank releases their third quarter earnings. So the next day would make sense that they crash the system, as in the system stops on the 28th. Now, until recently, uh, we, ha we had several analysts that were predicting a major upset with the September 30th edition of the Chinese yuan to the SDR basket of currencies. And we've had uh, two speakers on our uh, show talking about the dynamics and the risks that preceded that. Uh, in the in the wake of that, uh, we didn't see you know as as dramatic or as immediate a result as people had some people had predicted, and some of the people writing comments on our channel have scoffed and said, "Ah, oh, see, it's just the sky is falling all over again." What was your view of the the real risk of the yuan being added to the SDR, and do you think we that that story has played out yet? No, it, it, it's it's a non-event. I mean, it, the 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 value. You know, the SDR basket and, and how currencies are valued and traded, it's all done on computer programs and has been since the 1970s. The programs are controlled mainly from the basement of the U.S. Treasury and the New York Federal Reserve. Everything else is just talk and show. With a click of a mouse, the U.S. could take down the entire system if they wanted. They can also prolong it if they want. Um, through my work and looking at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston documents, and, and even what was written on the new brand new $100 bills in gold that you have the right to overthrow your government, um, I, I think the U.S. is ready. We are the largest debtor nation in the world. We would benefit the most if we destroyed the monetary system because all debt goes away. Electronic assets go away too, but that's always been the plan. You know, the, the unsustainability of you know, the, the debt in the United States really came into light in the 1970s. When they did a study on uh, it was the, the gold uh, the gold report that was done for Reagan, and the conclusion of that report was well, you know right now everything is fine. This is when interest rates had to go up to you know twenty percent just to stop inflation. Um, but the the gold report findings were that everything is fine right right now. But unless we get our budgets in order, I think the the the, the conclusion was that we'll have to go back to a gold standard. Well the Ever since the 19, early 1980s, the budgets have gone through the roof because 
what was being done was they were trying to destroy the dollar all along the best way to get back to a, a gold standard as determined by Greenspan in the 1960s and in some of his early writings was to destroy the fiat currency and the way to destroy it, best way to destroy a fiat currency is to soak up all the benefits along the way. So they've been running these programs to control the dollar and the and the price of gold and the price of silver and the bonds and the stock market, computer trading programs trading back and forth, unlimited resources. So there really is no fair market value of anything anymore, and there hasn't been since the since at least the early seventies, probably long before that. So things like the SDR basket, I would call that the bad guys trying to rejigger the system to keep it going, but. The, the people who are really in control, the people who have their finger on the mouse that they can click and destroy the system are in the U.S. Treasury and at the U.S. Fed. And that's exactly what they're planning to do is to destroy the system, not to keep it going. Now, we're seeing, uh, contrary to what some people were expecting, a six-week and greater lows in gold and silver over the last couple of days. Do you have any insight into what, what you think? Is this just more of the same that we've been seeing for the past five years? Or is this uh, going to be retesting some support levels and then, you know, clearing the decks for takeoff? Well, I, it, it, remember that the road to Ruta theory is that, that it's the theory that came out of the, I made up the theory, but the road to Ruta came out of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Ruta is root A. It's a computer programming term from BASIC, the basic computer programming language that was written by guy named John Kimeney in the 1960s and Alan Greenspan is the guy who used it in the 60s and 70s to control the markets. That's why he became the Fed Treasury Secretary because he was an expert computer programmer. He's the guy who basically invented the electronic asset back in the 60s. Um, one of the very first computer programs, Root A is the basis of any monetary system. From there, you get checking, savings, bonds, stocks, everything else. Root A is the basic position of the current electronic monetary system. So the price of gold, the price of silver, the price of the US dollar, the price of oil, everything is based off whatever they click on their mouse in the basement of the treasury. And that's that's a fact. You know, you can you can say, oh, they're pushing it down to for, you know to clear the decks for the next move up, but they're pushing it down from what? They still control the system. They can push the price of gold and silver to zero with the click of a mouse. It is very easy to do. All you do is send an unlimited sell uh, order into the COMEX and the price is at zero, and then you basically shut down the market and you win. So there, the, the problem that everybody who's trying to analyze these markets or, or in giving reasons why things go up and down is that they don't ex understand the full extent of the manipulation. The manipulation is total and complete, and all it takes is a click of a mouse. If they sell in the last four days on the comics, the uh, the silver that's been sold on the electronic exchange is 1.6 billion ounces of electronic silver in the last four days. Does it really matter if it was 1.6 billion or 1.6 trillion ounces sold on the comics? No, it doesn't matter because these are all electronic signals sent by a computer controlled by people who control the monetary system. It, and that monetary system has unlimited funds, and they, they're not going to tell you that they created another trillion dollars in electronic blips to control the market because it's all done behind the scenes. And it is all authorized by the, the Gold Reserve Act of 1934 that authorized the Exchange Stabilization Fund to dabble in the markets and control prices and control everything we see. And then when computers came in, to play in the 1960s, that was pretty much game over for our free markets. Free markets have not been around since then, um, but I do think they will return at some point when when the final collapse happens. And will it be gold going and silver going to a million dollars an ounce or zero dollars an ounce? It all depends on what they click with that mouse. So one of the points you're making there is that there's an intrinsic uh, link between the unlimited fiat money supply that is infinitely elastic and, and has no physical bounds and the ability to uh, have complete and total manipulation of the, the current price of, of precious metals. Of the uh, price, correct. Yeah. Because it trades at well over 
100 to 1. I've done the numbers. It's more like 350 to 1 to, on silver. The amount of electronic trades that go on on the COMEX and the LBMA compared to the physical metal. So, yes, any anything related to silver price is controlled on the COMEX and the LBMA. Before we stop uh move on to the next topic i still while we're still on silver and gold talking about the physical market though and possession and holdings of physical gold there's been a very uh strange and hard to understand from a traditional common sense point of view uh transfer of physical metals uh from all we're able to hear out of the western countries and into the east both uh, china and india uh, russia uh, central banks accumulating massive amounts of gold. Uh, so the topic, you, you came on our channel over a year ago to talk about where all, where's all the gold gone, but what I, we'd like to address today is, based on where the gold actually resides, uh, how will that affect the uh, balance of global political and military and social power uh, after the fiat system collapses? Well, it, it, it's an excellent point, but the, the data that you're reading about and hearing about is all fake. I mean, it's, it is a tiny fraction of what the amount of gold that is available, gold, gold especially, because there's all kinds of gold out there. We're not talking the 180,000 tons that, that the mainstream media will tell you has been mined you know, over the, the history of the world. That is a ridiculous number. The number's probably into two to three million tons. And that can be proven from many of these secret gold conspiracies, such as Yamashita's gold, all the gold hidden in the Philippines by you know, the, the uh, Japanese emperor. Uh, uh, the uh, Peggy and Sterling Seagrave have thousands of documents, official documents showing that this gold is real. And there was like 300,000 tons, like double the amount they're, they're officially saying. There's gold hidden in the Grand Canyon, a gigantic gold find. It was announced in the New York Times in the early 1900s, millions of dollars back then, real dollars, gold dollars, went into starting to mine that uh, gold out of the Grand Canyon, and it was going to be millions of tons of gold that came out of there. It was going to change the world, and all of a sudden, the news stopped, all the mining stopped. It, that part of the Grand Canyon you're not allowed to go into, and they created the Federal Reserve Bank. Literally within a year of the announcement from the the New York Times, uh, a lot of my work has gone into discovering. Well, the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, G. Edward Griffith's book on you know creature from Jekyll Island might have been correct in one instance, but it might have been missing the the reality that they had found probably a hundred times the amount of gold than that was in circulation as money. That is a gigantic problem. For society, because back in the early 1900s, gold was money. It would have devalued and destabilized the entire world if you are all of a sudden introducing that kind of, of gold into the system. And gold was money, so you're basically you're changing the balance of power massively. Um, and then there have been many other huge gold finds, at least in the United States, in uh, at Chocolate Mountain, in, in Southern California. Uh, that was in the 1990s. Diane Feinstein was in charge of putting it into a, a, a desert wildlife preserve to save it for the time when we move on to a, a gold standard and off the fiat money standard. That's basically been the, the U.S.'s policy since the – since the probably since the invention of the Federal Reserve Bank is to use everybody else's assets first while they're – while they're taking these unbacked fiat currency – fiat dollars that we have. Now it's electronic dollars. When the world takes those and, and we buy their their real assets, their in-ground natural reserves, that's that's a great thing for the United States. And when this system falls apart and people stop selling us oil and, and gold and silver and copper and their goods they manufacture in exchange for these electronic blips, then we'll have all this all these resources in the ground that we can use as money. So yeah, and and there is some in the conspiracy world. Uh, who are connected, who has said that there is a plan to go about and value the actual natural resources in the ground of every country. And, and the, the, USGS, uh, the uh, U.S. Geological Society apparently has been going from state to state trying to document all this stuff. Um, and other countries are doing the same in expectation that we will be transferring 
or transitioning out of the unbacked fiat system to something new, some kind of backing with a new currency. Uh, moving away from precious metals for the moment, uh, on, you also posted a podcast on the, from the X-22 channel that was uh, featured Martin Armstrong talking about the next great depression is going to be a collapse of bonds and government. In that, he talked about how the scope and scale of the bond market dwarfs the stock market and equities market that most people think of when they think of what's a good indicator of, of wealth in the economy. Can you describe... Uh, what your view is of the importance of the, the debt market, the bond market, as opposed to the stock market? Well, it, it's very similar to to all the electronic assets. You know, the, even the bonds, the bonds are traded just like stocks are traded in in the fractional reserve system. So, for every share of stock or every bond that's out there, fifty to a hundred times that amount trades every day on the exchanges. That's how the game is played ever since they decided in the early 70s to net all trades out. So you can have a Fidelity or, or some of these big, big pension funds. They net all their trades and all these high-frequency traders. They don't actually have the shares that they trade. They'll, they'll put their buy and sell orders in, and at the end of the day, they're required to net the, the net result of what they're doing. But – in reality, there's over 100 million failure to delivers every day on the stock market. That means there's no certificate, there's no exchange of, of title, there's no exchange of money. Um, bonds are the same way. And yes, the bond market is bigger in, in the monetary system, but that's not the biggest. The biggest is the derivative market. So you know, if you look at your hierarchy, it goes stocks and then bonds and then derivatives. And derivatives dwarfs even the bond market. So, yeah, and, and derivatives are kept off balance sheet for the most part. So that's how someone like Deutsche Bank, who owns stocks and who owns bonds and, and owns a massive amount of derivatives. Their derivatives are over 40 trillion euro. You know, U.S. dollars, probably around 50 trillion. But, you know, they're, they're crying because they got levied a, a fine of 14 billion and then that will wipe them out. Well, what in the world are they doing with 50 trillion in in derivatives? Um, so yeah, a, a bond crisis. I think it will all go together, though. It's it's one of those things. If if you take down Deutsche Bank, you take down all the counterparties of the derivative bets that they have, because every derivative bet they have is with another counterparty. And so you'll see all the other big derivative players like J.P. Morgan, Citibank, Wells Fargo. Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, as they go down, they take down the entire system. And that was one of, the, uh, one of the quotes that really stuck with me from those two podcasts that you shared was the statement that in a big enough uh, collapse, even the winners are losers because if there's a derivative that's basically a bet by one party that's held by another counterparty, if the losses are great enough uh, on the part of the, the person who's the loser – um, the winner has nobody to pay them back. I mean, you're basically you basically won an empty empty victory because the whole system has gone down. And there's nobody with enough strength to pay you back anymore. That's that's exactly it, and that's what happened. In, that's what was happening in 2008. And and the way derivatives, the way they say they hedge their bets is, you know, they'll write a derivative for one thing and then write a, a not exact opposite derivative somewhere else with a different credit. But each little bit, each each credit. In, increases the risk because you've got 50 different credits that are hedging each other with each other and all it takes is one of the big ones to go down that it starts the cascade it will take down when you know when JP Morgan goes down there goes all these other other derivative situations there goes all JP Morgan's customers who have bank accounts in other places too so it really is it's a, it's a big intertwined octopus that cannot be you can't surgically take out Deutsche Bank and have the system continue to function. It would instantly freeze all assets as far as not just derivatives, the stocks, the bonds, the credit cards, savings account, you name it, it would stop. And that's what they were that's why they call them a too big to fail bank. And that's why they're going after those who want to destroy the system are going after Deutsche Bank right now. Well then help us understand why you always sound so upbeat. <laughs> and uh, and and 
uh, when you describe this and you talk about the good guys wanting to wanting to crash the system so that we can get back to an honest system or something because a lot of the people that we talk to uh, they describe the plight of the uh, house of cards that this whole derivatives and debt and everything and they say when it comes tumbling down with the collapse of an empire and it'll be global because all the all the countries for the first time in history are all on this fiat system and they're all going to collapse and then we'll all just be living in the dark ages but how can you you come you seem to take a very different tack at that as far as saying no that's collapsing the false fiat system and now you can re reveal that you've actually got this uh, what this cache of um, of undisclosed uh, precious metals that we really have that that the uh, United States isn't as broke as we seem to think we are, or like, people are coming to suspect we are. I mean, what's, how does this come out to be a, a happy ending in, in, your, in your scenario? Well, the, the problem, let's get to the, the real problem with the unbacked fiat monetary system. The problem is the amount of debt out there, and, and everybody is swimming in debt. You buy a house, you're swimming in debt. You, you use a credit card, you're swimming in debt. Everybody is swimming in debt, and... That is the problem. Every country in the world is massively in debt. Every state, local, city, government, massively in debt. Some of that debt is very manageable. I mean, the U.S. manages its debt because they can print money. Uh, states can't print money. So you've got states like you know, Illinois going down. So, yeah, the, the problem, and I, I never say that, that uh, it's going to be easy to get to a better place. It's not. The crashing of the monetary system is going to be painful. There is no doubt about it. But the more pain is what we're living through now, the the debt and destruction that is happening. If you crash the system, you're getting rid of all that debt. All the electronic debt will be gone in an instant. Yes, the electronic assets will be gone too. And, and moving forward, there will be a lot of decisions to be made. And the big problem will be agreeing on something that's going to be the big problem. And even the Fed talks about that in their documentation. They're like, you know, how are we going to get everybody to agree on what to use next as money and how to allocate that money to the people? Uh, Alan Greenspan had a great idea back in the, the 70s, and that was to reallocate money to the citizens of the United States through their Social Security balances. And it's really interesting when you think about it because – it would reward them, give the most money to those who have paid into the system the most. But pretty much everybody will get something. And, and uh, the Social Security balances are capped out at, I think it's 100, 110, 120,000. You stop paying into Social Security every year. That means the ultra rich won't be ultra rich anymore. And the ultra poor won't be ultra poor anymore because all their debt would be gone. So it, and every every state, city, and local government would be funded with the new money coming out of whatever we decide to use as money. I think it will be gold and silver. Clearly, the new hundred dollar bill shows gold all over it, and the, the Fed uh, pamphlets and documents that I've analyzed shows people going into banks with gold coins and dollars and cashing them in. Do I think that's the future? I think that's part of the plan for the future because there have been plans to destroy the system since the 1960s, um, if not even before that. I, I think even the advent of the Federal Reserve Bank had to do with that gold that was hidden in the Grand Canyon, and there's a lot of uh, gold certificates that were issued in the, in the 1920s and 30s that everybody's kind of scratching their heads saying, you know, where did these billion-dollar certificates come from? That say the U.S. you know is it, they're they're gold backed and the U.S. will will fill them with gold and I you know I think it's all connected to these huge gold mines that were found in the United States. In the uh, articles that you posted, they also talked about a mysterious um, or inexplicable uh, lack of congruity between the actions of the federal government of the United States, uh, specifically our foreign policy, such as picking a war with. Putin over in Syria versus what would actually be good for and in the interests of the American people. And there was a suggestion, and we've had Rob Kirby on the channel, he was weighing in as far as the interests of globalism uh, being served rather than the national interests of the United States. What's your view, especially as we head into this election, election season, about the choices that lay before people in terms of what is actually going to be in their interest and in the interest of the nation our sovereign state of the United States versus uh, not in, in, in that interest? And, and what choices do people have? Well, there, there's no doubt there's been a, a struggle for 
power within the United States between what I call the good guys and the bad guys. Good guys being, you know, people who love their country, the nationalists um, against the globalists, the people who are out for, you know, whatever they're, they're out for power, they're out for money, they're out for control, um, they're out for, you know, shrinking the size of the population, poisoning our food, all that stuff. Um, I think a big, sh- I, I think within the U.S., the, the good guys, as I call them, the people who are love their nation, have been were in control for a long, long time, all the way up to probably the seminal moment was the the assassination of Kennedy, where the good guys kind of went into hiding and the bad guys took over, and and ever since then, you've got you know people like the Bushes and the the Clintons and and people who control them, George Soros and. And Brzezinski and, and all these guys who are have been basically running our country since the nineteen yeah, at least the nineteen seventies. Um, and that's if you read John Perkins's book Confessions of an Economic Hitman, it gives a great a summary of what the bad guys do, how they do it, going into every country, uh, exploiting them for their resources, getting them into debt, using debt as a weapon. Um, I, I do think they're getting kicked out. I think these bad guys have lost control of the U.S. military. So even if Obama and Clinton and you know John Kerry want to go to war with Russia, I think the, the good guys are in charge of the U.S.'s um, military now once again, which is great news. So all the talk about a nuclear war with Russia that, that Clinton and her friends want to foster – I don't think it'll happen. And, and a good sign that that's not going to happen is when the Obama wanted to bomb Syria uh, and the Congress said, no, 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 we're not going to let you do that. You know, after they Assad pa- crossed his Obama's line in the sand and and Obama was basically told by the military that, no, we're not going to accept an order to to do this anymore. We've been led around by the globalists and the people who control you for long enough Great sign there, and I think that's still true today that the military, the U.S. has control of their military once again, and and they're not going to allow um, people like Clinton and Obama and the people who tell them what to do. They're not going to allow them to to start World War III. Um, so yeah, I, I I think it's a good sign, and you know the whole election thing. I I think the good guys have all the dirt on Clinton they need to destroy her. Uh, with a couple of these emails, you know, they, they've decided to, to kind of leak them out week by week over the next few weeks, but I think it'll be enough to take her down. Um, and, and if you think about it, you, you want to take Clinton down closer to the election time so the bad guys don't have time enough to put somebody else um, in her place to do her bidding. So I think that's all happening and, and going forward. And, you know, I don't know about the Trump wild card. I know a faction of the good guys want Trump in, but there's another faction of the good guys who say, no, we're going to crash the system and, and go without a government for a while. Um, and I, I, I'm kind of leaning on that side, but if I had my, my choice between Trump and Clinton, I'd take Trump. But I would truly, I would rather have a an election after the crash, after they take these bad guys out and, and the, the crimes of the the Clintons and the Bushes and the Obamas and and the George Soroses of the world all get exposed, and then we can have a true election, a real election, with real candidates and real people who who have the best interests of of the nation in in mind. Um, that's that would be my pick. But um, there are there's a faction of good guys that want Trump to get in because they think he can uh, foment a kind of a smoother transition. I I'm not so sure about that. And. In that sense, we've got these forces at play that just dwarf the ordinary person and their ability to control or influence these these huge things is minimal. But what is it that each person can and should do to regain a, some self-control over their future, some, some control over their destiny? Um, I, uh, right now, it's such a critical point of of the banking system and the electronic monetary system that you need to be able to go self-sufficient for weeks maybe even months self-sufficient meaning you have access to water and food and you have protection and and all the things that you talk about on your on your channel now more than ever is the time to to finish those preparations and have everything set and ready to go 
so that the moment that the your the ATM shut down and the credit cards don't work and you can't get gas or electricity, you are prepared at least to to ride out a a, a small hiccup or a decent sized hiccup. I think in the long run, if it goes more than a few months. I think we're we're walking into a Mad Max type of world, or at least smaller communities getting together and and saying, "Oh well, since we're cut off from the rest of the world, we're going to have to take care of ourselves." So yeah, get get with your neighbors, get with your friends and family, have a plan, um, then have you know rations, and and just think of a way. You know, do you have to plant a garden? Do you have to uh, have access to water? Do you have a water purified? Things that are basic for the necessity of, of life need to be within your reach now, not not next week, not the week after, because it, literally any moment the system can freeze up. And when it does freeze up, there might not be a smooth transition to the next system. Well, good words for thinking and uh, action. Uh, Bix, before we let you go, do you have any, any final thoughts for our audience? I, I'd say keep an eye on the big the big thing that you're going to be asked to do is it's not about the crashing of the system. The system's going to crash because the bad guys and the good guys want it to crash for their own purposes. The good guys want it to crash to get the bad guys out. The bad guys want it to crash to erase their bad deeds. The, the real question is going to come down to what happens after the crash. Do we turn to our government to, for protection or do we turn to ourselves and say, hey, we can create a different world, a better system than what they had created for us. That's going to be key coming up. Bix Weir, founder of RoadToRuta.com. Thank you so much for joining us once again on Reluctant Preppers. <laughs> Thank you, Donegan. <laughs>